This is Della Show. I'm the bro. And you're listening to Disarm at the Armory Club in San Francisco. I'm <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Disarmed at the Armory Club. Uh, how you doing out there, carbon-based bipeds and other cosmic scavengers? I am here with a very, very special guest who we've been wanting to have on the uh, podcast for a while now. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, Adrian. Hello, Adrian A. here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. We've been, as I said, you've been on our hit list for a while. And for so many reasons, I... I think I feel like I'm already fatigued by trying to think about mentally what to unpack. With, well, with all you do, Moody Mashup is really the, so the big DJ, claim to fame. Promoter, yeah. sure. Keep stacking feathers uh, in that uh, hat. Singer <laughs> of Smash Up Derby, publisher of Burning Man That's newspaper, right. Piss Clear. Yeah, yeah. That is now the BRC Weekly. Um, local performer, um, international DJ. Uh, yeah, just okay, um, the resumes. Yeah, people. I know, I know. The, the, the CV is ridiculous, right? You know, hopefully, if you're on this planet long enough, you know, you just keep adding more hyphenates to let, your. Let, uh, yeah. Let's start with because one thing I was seeing um, that I wanted to run things off the top with. Sure. Um, you know this comedian Eric Kroll, you know, uh, uh, perform or uh, actor comedian. Okay. So he was. He's going. Apparently, he went to Burning Man. And I'm sure an old season vet like you kind of knows the drill where you see a celebrity that goes and then they go on to these talk shows and they, oh my God, it's the blah, 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 blah. And you kind of roll your eyes and go, oh, fuck, you know. Um, there's probably a mix of all kinds of different ambivalent... Well, I think um, there used to be. I mean, I'm... Well, so maybe that's changed. I'm like, well, well it's. I can only speak from personal experience. Um, I've been going to Burning Man um, since 1993, so this was my 26th burn. Holy shit. I know, crazy. Um, and You're like made out of <laughs> dust. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I, I, th- I think part of the reason I still go is because um, I never got too close to the source of the flame, so to speak. You know, I I have my own projects out there. Meaning the, organi- the board. Meaning the organization, the yeah, board. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people get like, you know, they, especially when you've been going as long as I have, you, you know, sort of like, get, you know, you, you work your way up to getting a golf cart. <laughs> Here's your magic right, prize. right, but um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I never did that. Like Burning Man's been a, a fairly significant part of my life, but it was never like, you know, the be all end all. So um, I went through my jaded phase, you know, where I was like, oh god, you know, well, it's like 20, it's how being many t- how many times is it? Uh, twenty. This is my twenty six. Twenty six. Coastered up and down like multiple oh, times. A few times, that, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, this was. You know, d- definitely kind of reached a burnout factor. I roll, some I, point. I roll a coaster up and down within one. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, and I, I mean, people talk about you know, I mean, people have been talking about oh, Burning Man jumping the shark since like ninety five. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you yeah. know, ninety six. I look at like early issues of Piss Clear, and there's like the, in the very first issue in nineteen ninety five. Um, for those who don't know, Piss Clear was the Burning Man newspaper. Uh, started in 1995 
ran for 13 years. Um, it's now compiled into a book called Burning Man Live. Which I, I own. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And then uh, after two years of not doing it, I, I could not publish a newspaper out there. It still felt important as much as newspapers are completely dead tree media right now, but yeah. whatever. And so then it relaunched under a different name called the BRC Weekly. Yeah. Uh, the main difference being is that there's only one issue a week, but, you know, hey. clear was every day? Uh, there were years where it was every day. Yeah, crazy. That we went like four, you know, every day or every other day. Um, and for, there were a few years there where we were four issues a week. Now, my question about that is how do you not, here you are, and you have a staff. It's not just Adrian, I'm assuming. And yeah. People I mean, I'm, the, I'm the, the, the queen bee in charge, editor, but yeah. yeah. How are you doing something that is so... Uh, that's the word I'm gonna look. I mean, it's such a backbone of the experience of going out there. I mean, in my early days going out there, when you went to the before I knew any better central camp, you were looking at you know piss clear. Oh yeah, no, I love. I mean, people still do that. I love going to the cafe, dropping off boxes of papers, right? And there's people sitting around reading the paper. How, That's lovely. My, my, my question is, how did you not get co-opted into the main? Oh, that's easy. Because you, I mean, you're you're part of the institution. This is why. Um, Burning Man already had a newspaper, but their newspaper sucked. See, I'm ignorant. So, oh yeah, was um, it was called the Black Rock Gazette, oh, that's and right. um, that's and it was basically just like a, it was like a corporate newsletter. It didn't, it, it wasn't, it didn't editorialize. It, you know, it had very little actual, real, useful information, and it mostly just seemed as a way to regurgitate yeah. stuff that was in the survival guide for newbies. And you know, we wrote about things that were happening out there and wrote about the, the... I mean, we still do. We write about the culture and the lifestyle of Black Rock City, and there's so much material. So uh, that, that was why. And we... we very much, I mean, we wanted, I mean, it started off as a little bit of a piss take. It's like, oh, well, Black Rock City wants to be a real city. You know, you got to have, you know, we're a two newspaper town. Yeah. You know, you got to have the, the, the competition across yeah. town and, you know, kind of like taking pot shots. We were like the scrappy independent newspaper sure, sure. and they were like the stodgy, you know, like we were the Village Voice and they're the New York Times kind of like, you know, in that, that sort of like, <laughs> you know, that kind of, uh, you know, the, the, they're the old the old guard establishment and we were like the the scrappy you know independent news weekly yeah, yeah. and um, and then the, after 13 years they ended and then a lot of the staff from the Gazette started a paper called the Black Rock Beacon so there's actually two newspapers the Black Rock Burning Beacon Man. is current it's current yeah oh, they, okay. and they actually produce every day out there I only do one issue a, a week they do right. they do like five I mean it's not as big as what the BRC weekly is it's not printed on newsprint it's more like just a photocopied um uh broadsheet but um but yeah Bur burning man uh, black rock city is still a two newspaper town <laughs> so so this and that i want to circle back you say like taking the piss so this actor who i'd never heard of before or the uh, comedian slash actor he's going on these talk shows and and one thing he said that really um kind of made me think wow this is kind of different than the usual narrative that you hear from some first timer that goes out to BlackRock is he really emphasized because you know a lot of people think it's like a cult and there's all this obsequious like and we all know there is that demographic of people oh. who are planning their calendars and oh yeah the no, burn no, and blah 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 yeah. but he's like you know what there's a lot of people who are just truly fucking with you out there and it's like a prank and I'm thinking you know what that's thank you because the Burning Man to me has always been the power of the prank the power I call it the power of disingenuousness and piss clear exhibit A. Oh yeah, no. I we, mean, it's like I mean, we never we never <laughs> printed fake news. That was never a thing. There was a different, uh, two different publications out there that did that. The what was fake news about um, Black Rock City? I know. <laughs> I mean, I always thought it was kind of ridiculous because it was like there's so much stuff out here you don't even have to make stuff up. But but you know, I mean, they would do things like oh, you know, Burning Man's gonna you know get bought out by you know Pepsi or I don't know something ridiculous. Yeah. They would just make stuff up um, uh, Spock Science Monitor was very much sort of satirical and then there's a um, there used to be I didn't see it out there this year so they probably ended but um, you're familiar with The Onion sure. and their brand of yeah. fake news they had something called The Shroom uh, and it was a, oh, it, yeah, it was a, it was a really that. enjoyable read That's but, um, done. but yeah but our, our thing has always been about snark we've been like 
Burning Man Snarky is... Snarky reverence. We love Burning Man, but we're not precious about it. We're not burnier than thou. And I get yeah. the whole... The um, I mean, our newspaper isn't, a pra- isn't, isn't pranky in, in the sense that we make stuff up, but it is very much like we don't take the event too seriously. Yeah. You know, it's um, we loved it in 1996 when John Law, one of the original organizers of Burning Man, put a smiley face in the head of the man. And I'm still very proud of the fact that we were the only ones who, I mean, it was sheer luck um, that I happened to just be there for the five seconds they turned the neon smiley face inside the man's head. Chicken John took been a, talking about that for decades. Yeah, took, took, <laughs> took a photo of it, and um, and I was able to run it in the paper. Um, it, I, we had already finished publishing that year, so I ran it the following year, and it ended up like on um, in a uh, the cover of yeah. the 10-year anniversary of. I mean, that was 1996. That was yeah. like, in many people's opinions, the first turning point year of Burning Man. There's been a few, but that was definitely like one that really changed things. Where yeah, I had to institute rules. Had to like okay, um, we can't just kill each people. other, everyone. Right. I mean, I mean, down. that was that was the, that was the year. <laughs> you know, people died. People were driving around like crazy. There was you know lots of accidents. It was it was obviously like okay, this is this is too big, and we need to now you know yeah. have some sense of civic responsibility out there. Um, but that didn't, and that's why I've always been a fan of of you and Piss Clears because the irre- the irreverence. That runs through that thing, the, in those pages, like, and that's what getting back. It's like this is the power is in, you know, Flash. Oh, of course. Yeah. So he said one thing one night, and I, he wasn't saying to me. I just happened to overhear. Flash is an old, another Burning Man old timer. For those who don't thank know, thank you, thank yeah, you. Yeah, one of Larry Harvey's uh, best friends. And uh, he said actually. once you once you realize that it's all a sham, then you can go on to enjoy it as a, the sham that it is. Yeah. And. And people always, oh, it's a cult, oh, blah, blah, blah. Well, once you realize that it's just a sham, it's just a fabricated, ridiculous cult that we're, it's all done kind of tongue-in-cheek, and I feel this clear, you know, is a perfect example of that, um, then you can enjoy it. And ironically, then the kind of weird sacred stuff can even follow within that oh, corridor, yeah, you know? I mean, I mean, like, the we're, thing is, we're sacred about being disingenuous. What I love, <laughs> I mean, I, I've had to sort of, like, I, I've had to sort of analyze... Um, why I love Burning Man so much because every year. there's um, I mean I've been going every year it's like and granted I DJ out there now yeah. I love throwing my party out there um, the booty mashup parties I think are especially with Burning Man culture I get into that. yeah I mean yeah. with Burning Man culture there's a definite like especially with um, camps and um, a lot like Robot Heart and um, and you know DJs like Diplo and Skrillex going out there and you know long term uh, burners like Carl Cox and Paul Oakenfeld, there's this very, um, uh, you know, electronic music vibe at Burning Man that has... There's you know, that we music think of, at Burning Man? I know, right? And so <laughs> there's this Burning Man music sound, you know, that, that you think of, and it's mutated over the years. I mean, techno to dubstep to, you know, straight up EDM. So I think actually doing pop mashups, playing music yeah. with words out there is its own sort of piss take, you know? Yeah. Um, but um, so, yeah, in addition to doing that, there are so many other reasons why I do go to Burning Man, and I've had to, like... like why? Especially because um, so like an existential well, like, like yeah a little what bit. Are we doing like, with why, our life, why, why am I doing this? <laughs> why do I still put myself through this? I mean, it's not an easy vacation, you know. Yeah. Um, and I think it's just because it's really fun for me anyway. I'm fascinated with the concept of utopia. Um, more specifically, I'm fascinated with the concept of failed utopias. I love um, I love going to um, I love driving down Route 66 and see, you know old Route failed 66 utopias. and seeing like you know the, these these um, you know all the all the roadside uh, hotels and things that have went out yeah, of business yeah. because well that that thing ended. The Go, Flamingo yeah, Moon yeah, Lodge. Yeah, uh, <laughs> going to I love um, my partner is based in Berlin. I I live in Berlin about a third of the year. I love, I'm fascinated by uh, East Berlin and East Germany, Um, not because I like fetishize socialism or communism or something like that, I'm just utterly fascinated by, they really thought they were creating like this amazing new society and it 
epically failed, you know? So yeah. Burning Man is also an experiment in utopia, but every year there are aspects of it that utterly fail, and I love yeah. that. But unlike, you know, say, um, you know, all of the Eastern Bloc countries or, you know... Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, resort towns that you know were boom and bust. Um, like other, like you know, I'm trying to think of like other sort of utopian things that have, have fallen apart. We um, get to erase. We get to erase Black Rock City every year and try again. Well, you know what? I think that's part of the feel what, of the success of it. If we all had to live there, fuck it. Right. It would be. You know, it, the whole thing open in flames. No pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's like it, since it's just this one week, right? And um, you know, I think I think it's able to survive as that. And a lot of people it gets a lot of crap for that. People say, "Well, this is not something that's so sustainable." Well, no, fucking course it's, not. <laughs> I mean, it's not meant to be. Yeah, I mean, this is a holiday. I mean, Don't a, forget, everyone. I mean, it's just vacation. It's just a camping <laughs> trip in the desert, hopefully with your friends or. <laughs> Or as I always like to describe it to people, um, you know, cause, uh, people are, you know, running to r- random people all the time, like, oh, you go to Burning Man? How is it? It's amazing, right? You know? And I'm like, yeah, but at the end of the day, it is simply survivalist desert camping pretending to be an arts festival. Do you, do you I mean, and is that linear? Like, you've, you've, as someone, as a veteran who knows, you've felt that the whole... So I want to get back. So There's a reason the newspaper was called Piss Clear. What was it? Because another... that, that, that was like a main sort of. I mean, you yeah. you were so in touch with the fact that it's survivalist desert camping. Yeah. You know? So and people, I mean, newbies especially get like gobsmacked by that because it's like, oh, I'm experienced going to festivals. I've gone to Coachella. I've gone to Glastonbury, and I'm like, well, yeah, but have you gone camping in the desert What's on for your a old week? Seat belts. And, and it's one of the most be a and, bumpy night, right? And one of the most <laughs> inhospitable environments ever. And, you know, sixty mile, mile per hour gust of winds blowing away their tent, and they're stuck in a dust storm. Yeah. And you know, is it just me too, or is it the? the I've always noticed. I've, I've been like a half dozen, six or seven times, and. It seems like the, the times when the weather is the worst are the best times. Well, um... And I noticed that from the very first time I went. I was like, this is freaking horribly into the giant whiteout. There's this and that. And people are like, no, fuck it. I'm even having more fun. Because well, here's, here's the reason. Um, first of all, nothing brings a community together like a natural disaster. True. Um, Good point. So it really galvanized yeah. everyone to, to help each other out. And, um, and there's also something very elemental about, like, you're... you're you facing down your own survival. I mean, you know, you don't get in touch with that like, oh at my your, god, your, shit's going down when it's office job, yeah, in cubicle land. <laughs> or even when the weather is beautiful at Burning yeah. Man. Yeah, you know, everything's perfect. What? Yeah, yeah. I don't know why they told me to bring dust mask and goggles. The weather's been I perfect. Do this you know, and, and there were, there have been years like that. And then and then of course people like I've had friends who were like, I didn't bring a I didn't bring more a warm coat. And I'm like, wait, <laughs> what? why what? why didn't you? I was like, and I realized well. Oh, the last two years I went, I didn't need it. And I was like, oh, well, yeah, but you never know. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, every year can be different. And, yeah, definitely if people come together yeah. uh, more strongly when, uh, when you're faced with disaster. So I'm curious. I'm, gonna, I'm kind of going into, I'm kind of not really worrying about the audience so much. I'm getting into more selfishly my own. <laughs> Thing. And 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 you said there's been a few different uh, milestone years. Oh yeah, and I'd love to hear. I, sure. Obviously, everyone knows 1996. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not necessarily. So, I mean, there's so many people who don't know the well, history I mean, of Burning Man, the, but amongst burners, sure. Yeah. Yeah. 96 um, was so, the you know the last year of. Um, Burning Man being involved with, uh, or rather, John Law being involved with Burning Man, early Burning Man organizer, created you know the neon on the man was very instrumental, and he left fairly acrimoniously um, over a power struggle of the direction of the event. He wanted it to remain somewhat anarchistic, you know, very sort of like you know Mad Max kind of style, 
and the rest of the organizers uh, wanted it to be a real city. So they outlawed guns, they outlawed cars, there are a lot more rules. So it's like, oh, finally Burning Man has rules? Oh, what, what's, you know, this I'm, event I'm you versed, know, is so I'm changing. Versed, I'm totally versed in that year, but what I want to know... You, 2007. You, oh, shit. <laughs> 2007. Are you kidding me? The year oh, that because of the Monday the early, night. The early yeah, burn. The Monday yeah. night early burn. So you would burn. say that there was, from 1996, okay, that, that whole lot was, was a, gone, and now we have to start it new. So 1997, it's a brand new thing, and now we're importing, we're gathering all these people, it's growing, it's growing, it's growing, and then 2007 was well, another milestone? I mean, if you look at um, uh, turning points, and, yeah. and, and what... What was sort of like a landmark of you know flash point event yeah. Yeah. that happened that somewhat you know didn't keep Burning Man on like a total like just you know slow slope of, of evolution, but that sort of like fundamentally changed the vibe, yeah. and that I think was definitely one of them as well. Um, it really was the, the end of spontaneity. Um, also. Um, the the person who did the early burn, Paul Addis, I mean, ostensibly, granted he was crazy as a loon, but ostensibly it was a bit of a protest of what he saw as Burning Man going, you know, like, like catering to... Um, uh, like following tech money and uh, trying we to attract. We were getting into tech money at that the, point. Oh in yeah. 2007? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Like, well, like the pay to play the, the green. And, well, uh, the uh, the the pavilion, the man pavilion. It was green man was the theme. I remember. And there were and there were literally companies sort of showcasing their wares. Um, their their wares. They're yeah. you know granted. Yeah. I saw know, that. Are for a good right? cause, yeah. environmentally friendly stuff, yeah. you know, things like that. And not not branded Burning at all. Man can help the planet. Yeah, I mean, it was that <laughs> sort of thing. And so that was a turning point. So it was like, I mean, and of course, that happened and Burning Man kept going in that direction. You know, still sort of like courting that. And then the other big turning point, I would have to say, would be 2012, which was the, uh, the well, first, year, first year Burning Man sold out. And ever since then, burning the Burning Man community has become emblematic of what's happening in America right now. Um, the haves and the have-nots. Oh, it's shit. very, Class very warfare. much more classist than yeah. it used to be. Yeah. Really dependent on those tickets. But then also with that year, I feel like plug and play camps. 2012 and, was the first time they sold out? Yeah. See, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was the t- you know, ticket apocalypse or whatever, yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, and ever since that year, it's sold out every year since. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Tickets are harder and harder to get. And you know, the, and, and there you go. So I, th- I think of those as... You know, so I mean, that's, it, that's the, that's the yeah. triad. 1996, 2007, 2012. That's what I think, anyway. That's what Adrian said. Yeah. So. <laughs> Well, the editor of the BRC Weekly said. Well, I mean, it's not an insignificant voice. I mean, if, if you, if I wasn't there in 2012, but I knew that in, I took a break for a lot of years. I uh, went in, I think, 2010, and then I stopped go, going until about 2015, and I was like, holy shit the fuck happened here? And I can only imagine people who, who went was, in, in the 90s and then they stopped and then they didn't go again until like 2000. All, it's a completely different animal, but I think yeah. someone who did that is probably already well aware of, of it changing. I think something like you, yeah. where you don't think it's going to change that significantly in yeah. just a few years, and yet it, it felt like it did to you. Yeah. For me, it's just, I mean, I have a a weird perspective, in, only in the sense of I've I've like got, got the gold star for perfect attendance since I since I started going. I really don't know anyone and else that Danger has. Ranger. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, yeah, you, normal you, pe- yeah, pedestrian. Yeah, right, type there of, yeah. there are a few. You know, um, yeah. you probably know uh, SF Slim. I mean, I know um, tons of people that yeah. were there back in the day, but consistently. Yeah, I've there are very, there are, I yeah. I know a few though, but wow. yeah. So, let's, I want to immediately uh, derail into Berlin. Berlin? Oh, what do you want to know? Well, I want to know what the hell you're doing there. What's going on? <laughs> and how did um, you get there? Um, so, uh, my uh, nightlife and music brand, Booty Mashup. Um, let's, whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's, yeah, that's okay. where it really has yeah, that's, to start. Let's unpack that. Okay. So, the fr- oh, and I have, actually have a little uh, story um, it's pre-booty about Adrian 
that is completely empirical, first person. Let's flash back to, I believe the year was 2002, maybe 2003. So my wife, uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, was part of a burlesque troupe, uh, the Cantankerous Lollies. They're doing a show at El Rio. Oh yeah, come on, I'm sorry, we go over. Well, there's gonna be, we're gonna be opening up this band, I don't know who they are, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so they come out, they do their thing. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is on the back patio in El Rio. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden this, kind of, sort of, I'm going to say synthetic new wave, but also weirdly hipster band with this crazy singer just all of a sudden launches a bunch of like pop confetti into the episode. <laughs> Blue period. Oh my god. <laughs> you don't remember that show? I, I'm like, I'm like, did we play El Rio? Oh yeah, we did play El Rio. I remember, it was a daytime show. It was a daytime and show. And it was, yeah. um. It was a benefit for something. It was a benefit. I forgot about <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Not, um, oh, I think it was a benefit to save downtown studios. Uh, downtown rehearsal gone. studios. Oh, well, <laughs> gone. No, oops, that didn't work. <laughs> but that was the first time. I, that was my first encounter with you. Oh, wow. And I was like, I th and I thought you guys were great. I was like, Thank this you. is freaking... We were pr uh, yeah, blue organically awesome. Blue period were uh, we were uh, proud members of the Almost Club. We were the right band, but at the wrong time. You know, yeah. we we got wined and dined and vetted and flown down to LA. I would imagine that and, you would have because yeah, you guys had the look, you had the sound. We had everything, had, but it yeah. just didn't. And there were a bunch of other bands in our scene, very um, very theatrical presentation, a bit of a glam pop punk vibe, um, rock based. Yeah. Um, you know, from New York and LA and some other places, and they got signed, and none of those bands went nowhere. I mean, the rock revival did not happen Are these in that direction. San Francisco bands? No, 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 no. This is like I'm thinking of bands. I'm going to name drop a bunch of bands you've never heard of, but wow. you know, Beautiful Creatures from LA, Toilet Boys from New York, um, Psychotica from Atlanta. Um, uh, so these were, you know, like I said, very. Uh, um, uh, queer friendly, if not 100% queer, um, theatrical presentation, uh, a andro usually an androgynous front person, uh, a mix of a mix of sort of like you know maybe like 80s glam rock, 70s 80s glam rock, but more updated. So this with sounds like pop there was punk. a whole kind of current of there was, out and there the rock the that the rock revival, that sort of Hollywood style rock revival. Yeah. Everyone thought it was going to happen, and it didn't. And instead, what happened, the rock revival did happen, but it was garage rock. Uh, that was when the White Stripes got signed, more and the, and like the an, Hives, and the like Vines. More like the 60s. Yeah, I mean, you know, that sort of like, like yeah. yeah, that kind of, um, I, I mean, I was happy that You guys had guitar, synthesizers. We had a keyboard player, yes. Keyboard yeah, player. we had a key, yeah, we had keyboards. You should have lost keyboard players. Nah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You still would have had like an androgynous, gender morphed freak like myself. On eighties, yeah, we were a little bit eighties influenced. But then, but then Electro Clash happened. Like, like a few years later with such yeah. an eighties influence. So totally, totally. anyway, well, um, yeah, that. Um, so what, what that. And when my band started breaking up, like a few years after that, you know, as bands that are so like living on the brink of like, dude, we're gonna make it, you know, kind of thing. Um, I started it must be emotionally harrowing. It is. I mean, yeah, it's like you devote your life to something yeah. for, and you just sort of any feel like any minute now, any minute now, right? Yeah, and um, <laughs> and then um, for shits and giggles, um, I just started DJing. You know, obviously, I was in a band for years. Loved singing. I loved music. Yeah. DJing felt like a bit of a cheat. You know. It's like I, I actually write real songs. I actually, I can play. I, I can actually. Well, I can't play an instrument. <laughs> Full disclosure. <laughs> I I was always the singer. I could write a song, but I couldn't play an instrument. Um, but uh, but you know, I uh, started DJing, and then shortly after that, discovered mashup culture, which was just so, let, bubbling. So slow down. Yeah. So that's. Let's let's go into. I mean, that's you don't just discover. Well, yeah, nowadays, well, actually, nowadays if somebody said that to me, I'd go, "Yeah, you discovered it." But this is back when there was no culture. There, um, it was two thousand one, yeah. two thousand two. Yeah. Uh, there was definitely no culture of it. I mean, there was, but it was it was underground. Yeah. It was small. It was um, MP3 blogs had just started. This is pre YouTube. Are we still in uh, in uh, in? 
Napster territory? Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. Um, and really, the advent of mashup culture um, can be defined by um, two things happening. Number one, um, audio software making the, the tools allowing one Editing, to take a, a um, you know take take two songs and mash them up into one. Uh, it's you could do that. You could chop it up, and it, it, you didn't, need, you didn't need to have a studio back then. Right? Back then, um, you would you would track down acapellas. Usually, as like B sides or studio leaks just, or like, things like that. Put the, put the, put the that. fade over the balance over to like one side. No, 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 just... no, no, no. Literally, you would try, try to find an acapella track. Oh, you literally. Yeah, and and yeah, on yeah. like a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of rap singles, a lot of R and B stuff. They would offer that. They would offer that as like yeah. a B side, yeah, yeah, yeah. um, and then you just take an, an existing song, and yeah. hopefully, there's an Enough chunks of it that are instrumental that you can then chop it up yeah. and and then put drop you know in put it. drop yeah. in it. At the time, it was like every other mashup seemed to be either Missy Elliott or Eminem, but then you know dropped over Led how did Zeppelin you, I mean, or how The did Cure. You, I mean, or, how did, what yeah. was the doorway that you walked into? Uh, what well, I had read about mashups before I had ever Where? heard one. Believe it or not, in Entertainment Weekly magazine. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, they, there was a tiny little sidebar. To Talking about a CD that was being offered by uh, Rough Trade, uh, you know, independent record label at the time, um, called the best, yeah, the yeah. best bootlegs in the world ever. Because at the time, the scene was based in the UK, and they called them bootlegs because these are all illegal tracks. These uh, these tracks are being made. These mashups, what we now call and mashups, when you, when you are made. When you say illegal, you mean because there's there, no no copy. Yeah, exactly. There yeah. there's yeah. the artists are not signing off on it. Yeah. Um, they. Are uh, you know, producers are literally just taking this into their own hands. I mean, it's, I mean, I said this at the time, and I still stand by it. it it's you know, it was punk rock for the early two thousands. Sure. I mean, sure, sure. back then, anyone you know, back in you know when punk punk rock started, anyone could learn three chords and start a punk band. Well, with this is anyone can, you know. Get this software, you know, you know, right? <laughs> well, it's also you know, you get the software at the time. Uh, Sony Acid was what a lot of people used. Yeah. Um, Ableton Live uh, later on, but um, and you know, chop this stuff together and release it. And here's the second, the second key thing that made mashups become a thing was MP3 distribution on the internet. Before you used to have to, well, I guess I can press a 12 inch single yeah, I made my own, or I can press, uh, 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 you know, ingenious. Uh, thing. Here, but what do you do with it? Yeah, but I, I got I got to take it to a record pressing yeah. plant, or I got to make you know cassettes, or, or 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 burn CDs, or whatever like that. Now you could just literally distribute it through this, you know, through the internet, which today we take for granted. It's like, yeah, of course, yeah. but you know, back then it was like it was it was much harder to find tracks because they, you know, you needed to know what. You know what MP3 blogs, and keep in mind, MP3 blogs was a LimeWire. brand new thing. <laughs> and yeah, you could dig around LimeWire, you could dig around Napster. I mean, yeah. these you know file sharing things. But it was super, super underground. And but read about it, ordered the CD, and all the CD was was really a a burn CD of like 16 of these tracks that they you sort of ma- ma- produ- mass produced. But you just read about it. No, I read about it, and then I ordered it. I you know I, I just ordered you it from it you're not, you know what, from, from the, the fuck I can do this from the UK. Well, no, actually. It was it was just love at first lesson because it was like oh this is everything I love I love music I love all genres of music we had just started DJing and uh, would, we're very multi-genre didn't want to be tied down to sure. like oh I only do house music or I only do you know indie um, I'm only you know. single step electro <laughs> right you know that kind of thing <laughs> so so this was like oh my god this is everything I love but like actually at the same time so uh, quickly went down internet rabbit holes after rabbit holes and discovered this um, a very small, fledgling scene of a handful of people. There was uh, a few message boards, a few MP3 blogs, and um, started uh, and then started producing our own tracks. And, and then it was like it was a little frustrating at DJ gigs we would drop mashups and people didn't know what to expect. They'd come up to the DJ booth and be like, um, can you, you know, it'd be like... Can you just play uh, one half of that? Yeah, just yeah. 50%? It'd be like, like one of the like <laughs> one of the first mashups I ever heard was uh, Destiny's Child, um, sm- uh, Bootylicious, over Nirvana, Smells Like Teen Spirit. Um, 
and that was made by Too Many DJs. I am pretty sure that was like the actual, yeah, that yeah, that, yeah, yep, yeah. Belgian duo who, yeah, yeah. you know, after they got famous doing mashups, then pretty much left it for dead and just went on and became indie electro artists like everybody else. They'll do that. They'll do that. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but, um, <laughs> uh, I mean, there's, there's always life to be had in mashups as much as people like, oh, it's been around, you know, it's like, isn't it over with yet? And I'm like, well, no, as long as there's new music yeah. being produced, there will always be new mashups. People are always finding new and creative ways to, well, I mean, so, so you know. So, intimate story about you guys in your ma- and I'm, when I say you guys, I'm talking about, uh, myself and, and Mysterious D. Yeah, my partner yeah, so at the I time. was, uh, uh, used to be a DJ at Scott's crazy Kiki Salon party, Scott yep. Holly and everything. And uh, we were doing, was doing something, and I think they were having a, maybe it was an actual Pirates theme? I hesitate to say, but then of course, of course they were. So, yeah, I mean, I was going to say, um, <laughs> knowing he, Polly, and, 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 yeah. Polly and Scott and, and yeah. Kiki Salon, of he, course there was a Pirate theme in there. And he had a CD, and it's like, um, uh, Adrian, I'm serious, D, Booty, Blah blah blah, mix blah, blah blah. I'm like, he's like, just play this, just play this. Because I was like, oh, I need to take a break. Can I take, can, can, do you have something? You know, it's like, yeah, I take this. And uh, I went to go take a break, and then I'm like, well, I'm, not, I'm not really taking a break now. I'm listening to this, like, what the <laughs> fuck is going on here? And this is like 2000. Four, yeah, pretty, yeah. I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. By then, mashups were already dead in the UK. Well, I was <laughs> completely unhip and ignorant, and just like, God damn, what is going on with this? I've never heard any. I mean, of course, there were outliers previously. Sure. Different things, but never heard a full mix that was. You know, um, all of it, one like after all another, well, after another, after another, chronic, all being yeah. good quality. And I think yeah. that was that's always been Booty's job. Um, circling back to how Booty started, mm-hmm. um, we'd play. You know, p- people would complain that when we played a mashup, so we thought, let's just craft a party. Let's create a party where the mashups are the theme. And we actually had this idea in like 2000. Two, like you know, pretty early, and then we kind of felt like we didn't really have enough material. Like I said, you know, in the early days, yeah, yeah. It, it would have been Missy Elliott and Eminem, like over and over and <laughs> over again. You know, which a country has had enough, <laughs> right? But uh, I mean, that time again, you know, remember two thousand two, but um, but by the following year, I felt like we definitely had a big enough collection to carry an entire night of just doing mashups. Yeah. And so we thought it'd be fun to like, you know, instead of like, you know, fighting the uh, uh, an audience of like, oh, you know, Did not, you like, guys, we wanna... was that kind of your experience? Oh yeah, yeah no, definitely. People yeah. would be like, like, oh, what is this? Or that, that, or they'd be mad. Hey, hey, can you just play the normal song? So we're like, okay, if we just have a party that's literally dedicated to this, it's like you know what you're yeah. in for yeah, yeah. by coming to booty, uh, a booty mashup party, then then we don't need to worry about people coming up to the DJ booth to complain that they're hearing. You know mashups. what you walked into. Right. Right, exactly. You know, <laughs> so uh, that was the, the start of it, and it's kind of funny now, years and years later. Um, I mean, I really feel like booty mashup is where the quality control of the mashup scene. I've everybody's heard you say that. I always like that. Everybody's heard mashups, and I hear so many people be like, "Oh, I hate but mashups." But I mean, that and, translates into I'm thinking like a fucking ton of time listening to shit. Oh, I, I mean, I listen to probably, um, you know, two, three hundred mashups each month and then call a list, you know. I mean, this is like... I'm already look, vomiting. I mean, you're a, <laughs> you're a DJ. I mean, you... I mean, I'm sure you have to, when you're preparing sets and stuff, I mean, I'm sure every... I, I would assume everybody does this. I don't know, but I'm guessing, okay, you're a house music DJ. I'm sure you're listening to a zillion house tracks, yeah, just trying to find true. that, you know, those tracks well, that are really going to work. What you really mean is 2.5 picoseconds, you know, on Beatport, or, you know, you're, you're going uh, no, through and you're... Oh, you know, uh, really? You know, uh, okay. I, the way I do it is um, I load everything into uh, into a playlist. A de- playlist just plays. Just plays. Well, I that's, think, that's yeah. actually, I mean, that sounds much more, I mean, that's like organically listening to it. Yeah, you know? yeah, and I don't like pay attention to producers and stuff because um, yeah. I don't like to play favorites when we put together our like best of booty albums or booty top tens. Yeah. I usually just wait for something to peek my ear and I'm like, oh my god, this is great! Who did this? And I, I look the time, and, and it, what? How do you have the time? I listen while I work. Um, I just like like music is constantly playing in my home, yeah. so you know. Oh, what's um, that? Oh, when yeah. you did that? I yeah, know, it's just like, you know, like it ends, yeah. ends up being a bit of like sonic. 
you know, it's a sonic background. See, that's my problem. All I play at home is tiki music. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's God, it must be so chill in your Everyone's home. Everyone's sending me tons of like oh. all this stuff, glitch and electro swing. I'm like, I listen, I'm I like, just, oh, yeah, 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 playlist of it because you know it'll go from like oh wow there sure are a lot of heavy metal mashups what's going on oh yeah. someone put out like a death metal mashup album and then it's like oh and then typical EDM stuff yeah. and then oh oh wow the, oh, I keep hearing this Dua Lipa song oh yeah that's the latest single okay that's why well, that's, you know and things like that I mean, so, that's, that's so gonna, it goes all over the map um, genre wise while I'm listening and that's I would think one of the byproducts you know beneficially is you're actually having to see I don't do that at all I'm not keeping I mean I have my little um, you know esoteric Crews that I'm that are giving me music they presume, but you're actually you have to keep up on pop music because a lot of pop music is what's being put into. It's music. true. I mean, yeah. and I now think of booty. I mean, as much as booty mashup is a like literally the theme of our party is we're a mashup club. But when mashups are no longer a novelty and are no longer like this niche thing, and everybody's doing it, there's a zillion YouTube videos of it. Then what becomes, what is, what's your unique selling point of your party? And I think what our thing is, is we just love pop culture. And we always, yes. like, there are so many people who come to our party that are not even aware that mashups are the theme. They just know, oh, hey, we play current stuff, and then it's mixed in. They're not even yeah. thinking in terms of well, mashups. they're not thinking that it's, with, like, that it's a with, genre. Yeah, they're they're, they're, exactly. Just, yeah. They're just thinking, oh, and then they play some throwback stuff, yeah. and you know they'll go, they'll go retro, but then they go current, and then there's a show, and sometimes there's drag queens, and sometimes there's burlesque, and you know it's like this yeah. whole, um, I mean, out the way I think of booty mashup is, especially in San Francisco, we started off as a very alternative queer party. Um, I mean, not explicitly. You know, it's not like we put like, oh, there's a hot. Not guy. exclusively. Uh, yeah, not exclusively, and not like. I mean, you know, you know, when it's a queer, you know, it's not like there's rainbows on our flyers and a hot dude in underwear. You know, it's like so. <laughs> you know, but but simply because um, uh, myself and Mysterious D are queer, a lot of our friends are queer. A lot of our our community, um, uh, our, our perform performers, and you know, the, uh, are all queer identified. It's you know, we got that audience for a bit, and then straight, normal, mainstream, straight people started discovering it. And yeah. now I look at our party. It used to sort of be about sixty percent. I used to say sixty percent girls. Um, 30% gay guys and 10% very smart straight men. Um, <laughs> and now it's like we don't get as many um, like queers at our party. I, I wish we did. But I looked around at like everyone running things, all my performers and the DJs and my staff, and it's like 90% queer running a party for basically 90% straight audiences. So what is that? I, mean, what is, what is I feel like a San Francisco outreach program is what I feel yeah, like. Um, I, think you're I feel doing like that's like some sort of city. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I feel like we're doing. It's sort of like, you know, it's like, hey, we play a lot of candy pop that you love now and remember from, you know, 10, 20 years ago. You're basically no and better than that hippie on Heat and Ashbury with uh, the guitar. <laughs> Just going like, oh, like Uncle John's band, you yeah. know, playing some dead no, tunes. <laughs> no, actually, what it is, I mean, people talk so much about how the culture of San Francisco has changed. Um, it's not artist friendly anymore. Yeah. Everyone's moving away. Um, rents are too high. I mean, yeah, all of these. This is something actually I wouldn't. Yeah, I mean, all of these yeah. things. All of these things are true, but at the same time, there is still a vibrant artist community here. There are still so many things that are great about living here and I kind of feel like you don't think you know, you're turning into like Manhattan Disneyland uh, in some ways yes yeah. and my job um as promoter and empresario of booty mashup is to okay tech kids who just moved to the city um okay you know uh you know people who are you know that uh, you know old school pakistani you know, uh, 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 programmers and everybody yeah. i mean it's just across the board just like you know like like tech pro just out of just graduated from you know some school in iowa and moves out here and gets a job at google and whatever i mean just this whole community of people who are here and I'm not a hater 
you know, it's like, yeah, the, the, the these these people. God, I sound horrible. <laughs> but you know, it's like um, this inf- this influx of new San Francisco yeah. residents. Um, yes, they are changing the culture of the city a little bit. Yeah. It is my job to help indoctrinate them and let them know, hey, this is actually the San Francisco Here, that you moved to. That you moved to. That you were actually yeah. looking for when you Ex- heard the mythology and everything. Exactly. I'm not moving away. Yeah. I'm I'm presenting and I'm hopefully presenting it in a way that that feels fun and interesting. That's I, I know valiant, I know Adrian. I know my per, I know my performers. A lot of my performers only play for like exclusively queer audiences or small, smaller audiences. When you say performers, you mean DJs? I or? mean uh, I'm I'm talking about like my burlesque performers. Um, not necessarily my DJs, but um, yeah. uh, my drag queens. Um, you know, like sometimes I have like pole performances. We do a whole variety of things, and they usually you know are mostly doing performances for their own communities. Um, whereas this is like breaking out of that and and um, and you know selling getting an audience that has never seen this before yeah. you know I can't tell you how many times um, I mean you certainly have done a lot of circus stuff in your time we've seen so many aerialists we're like yawn I love being at booty and there's an aerialist you know on aerial silks or a hoop I've seen it a million times okay wait for the drop there they go pinwheel down and I'm like yeah that was good awesome meanwhile my crowd Whoa! Oh, and they've never seen anything like this. Yeah, you know, unless yeah. they paid, you know, $100 yeah. for Cirque du Soleil or something. Yeah, they've yeah. never seen it just like at DNA Lounge, like in a nightclub environment, you know. Um, and so I it's. I think what we're getting, uh, I think the reality we're getting out to is you are a steward of San Francisco culture. And that's, I, um, huh. when we started, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, when we started bringing booty to other cities. It really felt like I was exporting San Francisco culture. This this inclusive, eclectic, straight, queer, gay, trans, whatever. We don't care what your identity is. We don't care if you're rich or poor. It was like um, Mysterious D has um, used to have this wonderful quote where it'd be like you know the the um, the you know corporate um, Wall Street you know uh, stockbroker uh, dancing on the on the floor with the indie the indie record yeah. store clerk you know yeah. like yeah. music brings people together and especially mashup culture can really bring people together I where, it. yeah um, so. you know a lot of the, the thing about uh, like you hear a lot of gripes about um, you know San Francisco losing its Diversity and a lot of a lot of the gripes are well founded in Definitely. terms of uh, at least when I moved here in 1995 and to Lower Haight, I was basically in a ghetto. You walk outside and I could get just jack beaten, and I did it normally on a you know just that that would happen all the time. It was like this is a dangerous neighborhood. The other day, me and my buddy were walking down Haight Street, Lower Haight, over by um, uh, we used to be, we used to call it Midtown. Well, it was Midtown. Now it's Mall Towers. Remember and. We're going, he goes, God, this neighbor is so changed. And I go, what do you mean? He goes, oh, it's so dangerous. You couldn't really hang out this time. And I, and I go, well, I don't, I don't know. It's still kind of dangerous. He goes, no. And this couple walks right by us, and the guy looks to her, and he goes, so do you want to get some Froyo, or do you just want to do Netflix? <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, I guess you're right. This neighborhood is completely... But the thing is, in terms of the diversity and stuff, at least if you want to talk like multiculturalism, um... There is. It's constant. San Francisco has always been changing. It's always changing. It's always been changing. Yeah. And now people think, oh, it's getting this whitewashed. And maybe that's true in terms of some of the tech money and everything. But it's also getting a lot of crazy Pakistanis and Indians who are coming over who are There's a big se- in yeah. technology. There's uh, definitely, I mean, because of the tech and industry, Eastern people, there's a lot. Uh, yeah. Arabic people. Um, I mean, S- South Asian, uh, Korean. Korean, um, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, there's a lot of that and influx. So it's like the mutual is like you, you know, can't and, really and I always dogmatic about when it. people talk about like oh people of color are being pushed out. What they really mean are very specific colors. You know, um, they're not talking about those minorities. They're talking about specifically African Americans yeah. and and Latin, uh, the, you know, the Latin community. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, well, uh, there's within, definitely. If anything, it's a class that's getting pushed out, and that's a lower, that's low, in, lower an income. economic, lower income class. Right. That's yeah. I mean, and that it doesn't that doesn't see any race. That doesn't see any color. It's just pushing out people who don't 
you know, who are on that. Well, it line. does. I mean, there's definitely. Well, because those people are fitted into, you know, maybe systemically they're they're uh, uh, finding themselves in this. But what I mean is like, there's no sort of racist in terms of like who it lets in. It's it's talking green. You know, it's like money technology, you know, the peninsula, everything. And there's actually a lot of different kind of multicultural influx of different people from around the world who are not white, who are, you know, from all kinds of different places. And that's that's kind of changing the whole face of the city. And sometimes people, don't, I feel sometimes people don't really want to admit that, you know. Um, queer, sexual orientation type stuff, that maybe a little bit different I don't mean maybe you could speak to that a little bit more in terms well, what do you want to know I mean I would say this is still an insanely <laughs> safe place I mean it's like this is I mean if, let's, let's face it if you're growing up queer anywhere other than you know the two coasts then yeah, yeah. San Francisco has got to look like do you really you know, utopia. Tell you, and I'm going to take what you're saying as the gold standard do you think really middle, middle America is like I mean you've really got to say you're queer You've got to just run fleeing for the for the coast. <laughs> Is that what you're saying? No, not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, I would say um, if you are um, the L or G or B of oh, LGBT. Shit, we're picking out letters. Well, I'm not kidding. Um, <laughs> gay, uh, uh, being gay is a lot more accepted, and I think. Um, yeah, I guess uh, that's what I, I was, mean. If yeah. if you you know you're growing up in, I mean, I grew up in Ohio, so we can use that as an example. Um, I mean, I think growing up gay in Ohio Where is probably in Ohio? Uh, outside of Cleveland. Gotcha. And I went to college in Marietta, Ohio, actually. Gotcha. Um, so I would I would think that you know being gay in Ohio is probably a lot easier than when I moved here. Yeah. Um, but being trans is probably still pretty tough, you know. Yeah. Um, I would say if you are um, if queer and um, queer identified, uh, kink. Uh, if you're into like the uh, kink scenes, sure, um, sure. Uh, I mean we are at the Armory Club. We can talk about that. <laughs> Um, you know, San Francisco is definitely you're going to find way more of, of you know, resources in your community yeah. and your social circles than you will in, you know, a small town in Ohio, right. for instance. You yeah. know. Well, I mean, I think that that part is obvious. But are you going to find? You're going to find. I think, with the flip side is that, is that you're going to find a lot less, uh, 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 um, persecution. I guess. Yeah. 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 I mean, and America as a whole, despite, you know, despite what's happening in our country, it has gotten better in the past 20, 30 years. Yeah. Definitely. Do you believe um, that? Yes. Well, for queer issues, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, We're all in this together, yeah. you know. It's, it's, it, there's only one upward. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's often, you know, two steps forward, one step back. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, you know, hopefully it doesn't end up being two or three steps back. It, who knows what the next <laughs> two to six years have in store? But yeah, you know. that's true. But um, I, think, I think it's I think it's and and I think it's we're in such strange times in social media. Oh yeah, no, definitely. I want to put that in quotes. Sure. Uh, well, I mean, y'all need to put it in quotes. It's up. It's it's real. It's it's a thing. What is it's, going on with that? What do you want to know? Well, why? Like it's. I mean, I think it's it's. I think the most obvious response is we've gotten away from talking. As I'm talking to you, I'm noticing your gestures. I'm talking to you as a human being. I can. There's much more earnestness in it. Cut to ch- social media, where we've started to see each other as, you know, just targets for maybe some opposition that we're talking about. I was looking at something that you said actually the other day. I was maybe going back a month ago. I don't even remember what it was, but um, someone just jumped in and nailed you right away. And you actually had like a nice, you're like, and I don't know what your relationship is with this person. I, I'm completely an onlooker. I, I'm wondering. And, and, and you're, like, you're talking about something on Facebook? I think what happened was, yeah, I think what you said was someone had uh, become asinine with you, as the whole mom on Facebook is doing with everybody in their, in their path. About some sort of you said, you kind of brought up your maybe resume. Here I am, queer, blah blah blah. Oh my god, this, I that, know exactly what it is. And, and, uh, yet, and I'm still getting ostracized for right. Okay, yeah. so uh, that was um, that was okay. So I don't I don't want to give um, 
the the very 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 small group of people in this very 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 fringe group any um, any publicity. So I'm well, not gonna, no, I'm, no, I'm not I'm not going to name them by no, name. name any, but of I did realize that the radical left is just as bad as the radical right. And that was sort of what I was railing against. It's like I'm, you know, I'm very, I'm queer identified, um, pretty fairly progressive in my politics, and you know, and uh, you know, outwardly, you know, I'm, I'm open and, and outwardly queer. It's not like I'm, you know, I'm, I'm pretty obvious and, and just like, and yet these people were basically sort of lumping me in the same box as what was like, the, like I don't a. Um, what the, um, will that give it away? I mean, no, no. Well, um, it actually circles back. It was an issue. Somewhat to what we were just talking about, yeah. which is. Um, uh, you know the changing nature of San Francisco, and this particular—I uh, um, mean, it was a few individuals were really just want to like vilify um, tech people. Like tech people That's are one hundred percent the problem. Talking about you. Stickers. You know, there were stickers. Yeah. There were saying fuck and tech um, or and yeah. and as if like tech people is the one and only reason yeah. that there is socioeconomical disparity in in San Francisco yeah. and it's one piece of the puzzle to be sure but to basically vilify an entire group of people which is like oh you're working tech you're the enemy yeah. I think is insanely short sighted especially given the fact that um, technology has given disenfranchised groups and queer communities so much more visibility and and um, like if you are a queer kid just sort of figuring stuff out yeah. if you're um, transgender and you like you know you don't know anyone in town you know there there's the technology the technology exists that can help you there are websites and apps and you know and so I think you know saying that all tech is bad is like some sort of weird reactionary luddite. Um, thing. It's like I get that you know you feel that technology, is, uh, you know, the tech industry, is changing the nature of San Francisco to a point where if you're at a certain economical uh, economic level, it's hard to live here. But you know, just trying to play the victim and and vilify an entire group of people, I yeah. think is. I mean, that's what that's what the right does in. They Diff- used different to. Yeah, ways, I mean that used to know? be we, that used to be the fight. Like, yeah. and now all of a sudden people are like, I mean, I see it as people trying to, like, a perfect words, vilify and find boogeyman where you know yeah. we're all here. I mean, why are we dividing up into yeah. all these things so, and ostracizing? I never, I never. It was it's just weird that um, I've never, I've never had internet trolls with any of my social media. And you know, I figured if I ever did, it would be you know radical. You got some now. It would be alt right and you know yeah. like, like kind of people or radical right or yeah. you know religious fundamentalists, but, no. conservative. I was a little surprised that it was like what I considered to be my own people who yeah. were coming after me, and I was like, yeah. oh, San Francisco identity politics. You know, somehow, somehow they were equating queer with also being. Poor and un and, and like uh, like this like this victimhood of of um, of a certain social economic status and because I happen to be successful with what I do, um, I think they saw me as the enemy. Like I somehow um, like like either I was born into money, which I was not, or uh, you know I somehow didn't work well, for it. There's a giant it, white but, box there that we can. And that's the only thing too. I am white. The color of my skin yeah. is white. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I'm also visibly transgender. Well, I mean, queer that's the whole fuck. ridiculousness I mean, of it. Are we you know, really getting down to racial yeah, skin colors again? Right. Isn't that yeah. what we were trying to get away get from? Get away from, right. <laughs> you know, and I really I never I never played a race card with any of this argument, yeah. you know. Um you know, it's uh, people of color have very, very, very real, cons- v- you know, concerns, like yeah. valid concerns about about a lot, of, you know, so many things in our fucked up American society. Um, uh, but uh, you know, it was just weird to be um, <laughs> to be the the villain. <laughs> I was like, oh my 
my god. god damn you. So yeah, so I, I yeah, I, I wish I wish I could remember the exact quote too, but yeah, it was like something like only in San Francisco can I like, you know, uh you know, well, that was your that was punky, you punky, punky yeah, colored, yeah. Yeah. red haired, uh, openly transgender, queer. Um, I you know, like a, 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 you know, vegetarian, thing. progressive. I yeah, mean, I don't yeah. even know, like, the all the things, on, like, like be a, a, like, basically, I was like the, um, a, the, you know, the face of corporate. Uh, corporate back gentrification or something yeah. like that. Like yeah. I'm, I'm a, I'm you a, are. I'm a gentrifier. <laughs> when you, know? <laughs> you know, it's like, I, yeah, I, I'm smart with money, but that I, I was, I was poor, poor, poor. I was poor for years. I was good at being poor. Yeah. I knew how to live off of very little money, and I lived. I thought of pretty fruitful life, yeah. and. I've made some money. I've been lucky. I will fully admit it. But at a certain point, you also create your own luck as well. Um, a, a lot of booty, yeah. booty mashup was lucky in that we came across a genre that also wasn't really a genre. So as music evolves, it continues to evolve. It wasn't like you know we could have started an electro clash club in 2003. Thank God you didn't. Do and that. it would have. I love electro clash. <laughs> I, didn't I mean, see what yeah. I'm saying in terms but, of the but, it, but as far as like yeah. trends go, that trend yeah. came yeah, and yeah. went. Whereas I feel lucky that like um, uh, uh, booty mashup is a little bit trend proof. Yeah. Um, but a lot of like the success. I mean, the the party's been around for 15 years. We're a San Francisco institution. It's been reverse engineering what's worked. Like, okay, I didn't set out, like, I literally threw a party because I just wanted to throw a party. Here's the music that I like and love, actually. I mean, very passionate about. And, um, and oh my God, it's successful and people are coming and then even more people are coming. And like, okay, what are we doing right? What is what is happening here? And what is it? If well, what is it? The, the, the <laughs> what are the secrets? Um, denominator well, recipe. Number one, number one is to <laughs> really be passionate about what you're doing. Yeah. Like, if you're, if like, so many people, um, I get this question a lot from um, young people who want to be a DJ. And they're like, oh, I want really want to be a DJ. You know, okay, can you teach me how to DJ? And I'm like, well, what do you want to DJ? And they're like, I don't know. And I'm like, how can you not know what you want to DJ? They just want, they want, they want the rock star aspects of uh, being a DJ. Yeah. But you know, it's sort of like you know, um, I mean, DJing is the new rock stars. Like you know, 20 years ago, it would have been like, I want to be a rock star. Well, do you know how to sing? Do you know how to play an instrument? No. <laughs> do you ever, and this is actually a huge perennial question that I want to do. I just thought of it now, but I actually was thinking about it earlier that I wanted to ask you was, do you ever fall out of? Um, do you ever feel? I mean, what's the? I'm trying to think of the best way to to say it. Do you ever? Do you ever? I mean. Like we were talking about Burning Man earlier, you said, "Well, I've had roller coasters, ups and downs." I'm saying, yeah, in sure. In terms of my optimism, in terms, I mean, do you ever feel that the same way with, you know, playing playing music for people, keeping a dance floor going? Oh, absolutely. I, um, that's I, it's something I've like. Uh, but it depends on like I noticed I noticed this transition when I went from being in a rock band playing original music, and to being a DJ there is a conversation between the performer and the audience yeah. as a band writing my own songs um, the audience is there for you like they love they love you they love you because yeah. oh my god I love this song they they want to see you it's about you 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 yeah. I wrote this song like you know like they're um, they the, 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 the energy, yeah. the energy is that way. Whereas, as a DJ, you don't have like these twenty songs you wrote or thirty songs or whatever, and that's all you've got. You're just larping. You've got, you've <laughs> got, you've got the last fifty years of music at your disposal. I mean, conceivably, and you are there for them. Like the audience is who's important. So sometimes at, at Booty, I'm playing songs I don't necessarily love, but the audience loves it, and that's I'm in service to them. And um, not every DJ feels this way. You know, there's a lot of DJs out there who are like, oh, I've got the most. No amazing, I've got. I've got the. Oh yeah, I don't take requests, and and um, you know, oh I, uh, you know, I'm I'm a tastemaker and all that sort of thing, and. <laughs> 
that's not you know like I guess because I already had those I got I got um, because I was already I was already a rock star in in being in a band like as a DJ, I always felt like, okay, no, now it's you now it's need that you, exclusivity yeah. to kind of like put you up on a on a pedestal. Exactly, yeah. right. Um, yeah. And like I said, not. I mean, this is definitely not a thing that a lot of DJs uh, aspire to. Um, you know, a lot of them are like, oh, I'm a too cool taste ma- taste maker, and you know, and and uh, and actually, DJ culture has gotten to the point where DJs are now rock stars. It doesn't matter what you play; people are going to love you anyway because your name is Skrillex yeah. or Diplo or whatever. I mean, insert names here, but you know. Um, so, uh, I don't know what was the point. <laughs> I feel like this entire <laughs> podcast is just like totally that's, that's our going, just, going you know, off on like in different places. I knew that was what was going to happen was I was going to invite Adrian on, and it was going to turn into it was going to be like one of those fireworks that like then that pack blows and then another <laughs> doesn't go out that way. Then those each like blow and those each, and you're like you know what I want to one way and I want to talk about that and then oh, she did that and she said oh we've covered a lot. Let me see we covered. Um, yeah, you know, Burning Man yeah. and uh, what's changed? Uh, San Francisco culture, what's changed? Booty mashup. Uh, we've talked a bit about so you're that. You're like a curator too of oh. conversations. Uh, well, uh, I, <laughs> I'm very, very, I'm a very Type A personality. I'm really, um, I'm, I'm good at organizing. Are things. you? Are you? I mean, you're going back and forth between here and Berlin. Yeah, you wanted to talk about Berlin. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, that was that was how we never got there. Um, <laughs> so. Um, uh, as as Booty became established as a uh, the mashup party of the you know we're the soundtrack of the mashup scene, um, uh, people from all over the place got in touch with us. Uh, hey, we want to throw a Booty party in our city. How do we do that? And we would you know reach out. We'd make connections. You network. It's you know like any other scene, uh, especially. Uh, you know, through the internet makes it so much easier. So we ended up like connecting with all sorts of producers. You know, um, hey, we love your mashups. They're great. Yeah, you want to start a party here? We'll help you. So we had um, there were uh, some producers in Berlin who had a party called Mash Up Your Boots. Myself and which they were actually playing mashups. And they were playing mashups. They okay. were they were a very very small party. They weren't like yeah. you know booty mashup levels. Just like more what like you, what more like a bar we, night. Like, I, I'm is, a chronological. Player. Yeah, this is like 2007. Okay, um, and so they invited us out to DJ. That was actually we my, the first time I was ever in Berlin was 2008, and we Me ended too. up. Yeah. Um, God, we missed the we missed the 90s. <laughs> oh, to be in Berlin in the 90s. Well, I, mean, uh, I went there and I was like, holy shit. I was in, staying with a friend in the the Mita me, uh, district. Mita, yeah, Mita. Mita. District. And it seemed like every door, at nighttime anyway, that I would push open, it was the entranceway to some fucking in, completely like intoxicating, uh, exotic cabaret or dance party or something. It still can be. I mean, it's yeah. like, this there's, place is there's a magical a, wonder. There's a, there's a lot of that. Um, but yeah. at, especially... After the fall of the Berlin Wall in '89, yeah. um, is a what is now really widely regarded as almost this mythical time for Berlin because it was such an it was like the Wild West of art and culture and business. Is this um, for is this reckoned as people who actually lived through it or just mythologically? No, no, no. It skipped a generation. They're like, well, you should, you know, our parents told us about both. when the wall fell. Both, because um, yeah. I know so many people in Berlin who lived through it and were like, yeah. oh my god, yeah, I was able to. You know, we just squatted at this place, and now it's like yeah. you know we've owned it for 20 years, and it's a long, you know, it's you know um, Berlin is the home of the abandoned warehouse or building turned art gallery, t-shirt shop, venue, bar, nightclub. Zero. <laughs> you, know? <Yeah. laughs> you know, and there's so much of that. <laughs> um, and uh, what made what, what what the reason why the 90s are sort of you know. Uh, sort of mythologized a bit in um, German culture is because um, when East Germany fell apart and East Berlin was just like wide open, all these abandoned spaces that were then taken over yeah. by artists and yeah. musicians, and so and it was like like I said, it was the Wild West in some yeah. ways where you know they things were not you know quite regulated. That's what they're I they're saw dealing there. with At least so in much. Well, yeah, that's yeah. two thousand eight. 
Um, I mean, every I've been going as long as you have, apparently, and I've, I've seen. I've been back since. That's why I'm okay. asking. Okay, yeah. so um, it's changed a little bit. Um, yeah. A lot of the same concerns that we talk about in San Francisco because or, of the EU or, or neighborhoods. Every, I mean, is it? Uh, but imagine money and sh- um, squats are getting shut down. Yeah, yeah. Real estate developers are like, oh my god, you realize there's this abandoned warehouse right on the River Spray. This is like prime real estate, and there's a bunch of punks living here. And you know, oh, but you, like fun to but you can't tear that down because they've been squatting there for 20 years. It's protected under some weird German laws, but then somehow, you know, money always wins, yeah. and then the yeah. punks get kicked out. And so, some of the same gentrification issues that we have here in San Francisco are also playing out in Berlin. It is definitely part of their um, uh, community conversations as well. Is it, is it true that and I was here that a friend of a German friend who lives there now, and he's in, in terms of the EU, it seems to be this um, vacuuming center of people coming from all over, whether it's you know different places, uh, uh, Scandinavia or uh, Greece isn't on the EU anymore, I guess, are they? I don't know. But anyways, Mediterranean, everyone just kind of coming to this uh, epicenter uh, Berlin, in terms of entertainment and well, nightlife. Berlin and, is extremely cosmopolitan. People yeah. ask me all the time, it's like, how's my German? And it's... Um, it's Are you working friend. on that? I'm working on it, but uh, <laughs> meine Deutsche Scheiße. <laughs> it's not very good. Um, um, but you don't need it. I mean, it's so cosmopolitan. Yeah. Everyone's from a different place. Everyone speaks English. Um, and unlike the French, uh, Germans are totally okay with speaking English. You know, it's like the 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 cliche. The German cliche is that you know, oh no, excuse me. Do you, you ever do? Is there do you, ever? Well, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the, the the German cliche is um, oh excuse me. Do you do you speak uh, English? And uh, they're like, oh, um, not very good, um, but I can try. And then they go on and on speaking yeah. better English yeah, 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 than, yeah, yeah, yeah. than most Americans. <laughs> do you do any? I mean, do, are you do you promote any stuff in France? Do you ever go? Oh, uh, we used to we ha- we used to have a booty yeah. party in France. We had Paris? we've had booty parties everywhere, um, and they come and go. You know, not every party is booty San Francisco yeah. that lasts for yeah. fifteen years. So yeah, we had a party in um, in France, uh, in Nancy, France, in Paris. Uh, our party in Berlin went on for many many years. So um, the the way it happened was it was there in two thousand eight was at a small bar night called Mash Up Your Boots and it was a great vibe. It was total booty vibe, but only in a bar. And I remember getting drunk and talking to DJ Morgoth, who was the creator of the party at the time. And I'm like, you know, it's got a good ring. Booty Berlin. You know, you know and he was like, no, but and he's so German. He's like, but if we do Booty Berlin, it's got to be done right. It's got to be bigger. And so they moved it to, they finally like moved out of the bar to a bigger venue and they sort of like graduated to becoming Booty Berlin. And um, and then I met, um, I met my current partner, uh, the love of my life, Jupiter Gatling, um, and uh, it, at a Booty Berlin party. So that's part of the reason why I'm in Berlin all the time is because my relationship is, um, I mean, we're kind of like actually at this point, I mean, you used to say it was long distance, but now it's, it's bi-continental. We, ba- we, both, we both bounce back and forth between Berlin and San Francisco. Scathing. Oh, uh, <laughs> Hot. <laughs> It's a lot of. It's a lot. I mean, we're we're both good with traveling. We both work for ourselves. Um, I realize I can I can run booty just fine um, remotely. Um, uh, I can book everything, come up with the themes, do all the bookings, send out all the production notes, do the, um, you know, Jesus the design and the promotion. Christ. That's all behind a laptop. People think that you I know, know, but still, just the, a party just the is, cognitive like, oh, space for it. Yeah, you know? I mean, pe- just to wake up and like, okay, now I'm gonna get. A now laptop. what do I gotta do? Yeah, yeah. right. I mean, I mean pe- people think that like throwing a party is is you know super duper fun, but all they see is the cherry on top yeah. of the whole. You know the whole thing. Um, it's uh, um, it's you know, no, the, know. The, the DJ gig is yeah. the last bit of it. Yeah. So you know, five minutes before the whole before doors. Adrian, can you get me and my friend in? Blah, 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 all the ah. oh yeah, all of it. <laughs> but anyway, so that's that's how you know. But that's how booty ends up in different places, and that's why I'm in Berlin half the time too, um, a third of the time really. But yeah. That's fucking awesome, and I, to me, at least in my Luddite mind, um, I think it's 
I think your whole little biography is pretty venerable. Oh <laughs> wait, which which well, which mean, part of the biography? Part, the going around the world throwing parties, um, you know, doing this thing, spearheading. Oh, living this. the dream. Yeah. I mean, be careful. I mean, I'm sure there's a downside. Sure. Short, I mean, and the, the the mornings you wake up mm-hmm. and you're fucking face down and barf and all that stuff. No. But <laughs> I, I I don't I don't party hard. I, I party smart. Um, uh, I mean, there's, there's, um, there, we're running out of time. They're, they're, they're yelling at us to get out of here. So I'll just make this real brief. Um, on the one hand, yes, I'm very, very much living the dream. Yeah. I'm very, very lucky that I get to play music for a living. That's what I mean. Um, yeah. Um, but at, at the same time, also be careful what you wish for. Um, success works in all sorts of different ways, and you know it. Um, it we, it, myself and Mysterious D, we killed ourselves to create um, a party that employs a bunch of our friends and people and created a community. But at the same time, we destroyed our relationship with it as well. You know it. Uh, you know, it's it's difficult working um, when your your business partner is also your relationship, and you know that's not a that's not a new story. No, I know it's not. Yeah. It's very common, yeah. but um, yeah. but yeah, but um, at the same time, I mean, I recently um, I'm now the pro- the only uh, business owner of Booty. I just bought Mysterious D out earlier this year, and um, and I think that's going to be actually it's better for both of us. It's like. I, I've got an amazing team of people here in San Francisco, LA, Seattle, New York, all like doing this thing that we love and yeah. we're keeping mashups. Like, I mean, mashups, I, I'm saying keeping mashups alive is what I was about to say, but that's actually not true at all. Mashups are always alive, they always will be. Um, but keeping it. Um, and keeping it fresh. There's always, there's at least we're there to be like, hey, don't forget, um, you know, this is not going away. You know, people said that remixes were a fad back in the '80s. Oh, God. And no, they're just, um, they're just part of the music landscape, yeah. and that's what mashups are. And Booty's here to remind you of that every week with a dance party. <laughs> Jesus Christ! See, I've already, um, which I knew going into this is I, we have to have Adrian for Adrian on for a second show. Um, there's just too much to unpack. It's got like, well, like I, a, I, 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 it's so it's so fatiguing that I want to leave your U-Haul down the street <laughs> and then just go get a beer with you. Oh my God! Like, <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk more. So many other things. Yeah, I know. I mean, there's so much have, stuff we didn't cover. I mean, have, so and much, I think, but. and I think in in that it's. I don't know. There's something, like I said earlier, I think it's venerable. You you have been a fucking San Francisco staple. You've done, you've, you've been involved in all these different things. Um, and not just involved, but, you know, like proactively, you know, uh, creating culture. Yeah. If I go on I mean, it, there, it helped yeah. that, like, when I first moved to the city, I was a scene slummer. You know, scene I, slummer. Slummer. Um, I, I, I would, like, I, was, I wasn't, like, just part of one scene. I would, like... I went to a gallery, an art gallery opening in the evening, then went to go see a punk rock show, and then went to an all-night rave, you know, and then the next day, you know, uh, you know, um, went to, brunch. you know, uh, well, to, of course, you can't, can't leave brunch out, of course, went to brunch, <laughs> but, you know, and then, you know, went and saw, you know, uh, um, an independent play, you know, at yeah. some queer theater, yeah. and then, um, and then went and saw a rock show, uh, you know, yeah. and that, that kind of thing, I mean, so it's like, always like, like, I love everything, I love pop culture, as you can tell, I love all sorts of music, so, um, being part of like you know sampling everything uh, that San Francisco has to offer, I, I feel like uh, I'm I've been in a, a very fortunate position that I am able to now offer that to sure. people who just moved to the sure, city. Sure, sure, sure. And hopefully, I mean, yeah, of course. And and I'm thinking like, uh, if there's anyone, I mean, that's my whole sentiment is like, God damn, just keep doing that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know, and that's and though that this is something we'll have to save for another, and I would love to actually have you back. Oh, uh, no, I think. Um, but in terms of how the fuck do you do it? We asked a bit, but that's kind of been our like perennial question um, with different people. We asked uh, Jim Sweeney. That was right. a thing. Like Jim, you've been fucking doing burlesque shows for the past fifteen years. Um, 
where where's the horsepower where's the fuel how are you finding that fuel what are you doing to make this all and he had some you know some pretty uh some great answers yeah um and jim and i both started our um our parties Right around the same time, I mean, Hubba Hubba Review and Booty Mashup have a yes. real symbiotic relationship yeah. in a lot of ways. You know, we host Hubba Hubba Review. Um, they do a show at um, at at Booty. Uh, my band Smashed Up Derbies played at Hubba Hubba Review. I'm about to do my first burlesque number ever see, um, at Hubba Hubba Review. See, I didn't That's another thing like too, that. Right? Oh. But, um, but yeah, but where do we? Um, but yeah, where do, I mean, the thing is, is look, if you've been doing. You know, um, if you've been doing something for a long time, you get to be really good at it. I hope, right? I would, I would, you know, yeah, I mean, that makes um, sense. Like, um, yeah. I, I went and yeah. got my, um, um, I'd uh, get uh, my 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 piercings taken out for some surgery, and uh, and I was really struggling. I couldn't get it out myself, so I had to like, go to body manipulations and do it. He just popped it right out, and I said to the the piercer, I was like, God, you you make that seem so easy. And he he said to me something that I always think of now. Um, is I'm sure whatever you do um, it, with your job, you're also re- very good at it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah, this it makes is, perfect sense. This is my job, and I've been doing it forever. <laughs> so, I, yeah, I would hope I'm good at it. Yeah. You know? So, and also, um, when it comes to what I do, sometimes um, just being the last one standing is uh, oh, is the key to success. You know. Um, Booty wasn't always successful. I mean, we, you know, we didn't really hit the 1,000 mark until like eight years into our party. I mean, we started off as 150 people on a Wednesday night at a bike messenger turned failing lesbian bar. That is the best description (laughs) I've ever heard. (laughs) And we worked our way up to every Saturday night, you know, anywhere from, you know, like 800 to 1,000 people at DNA Lounge. What do you see as the, I mean, this is the most horrible kind of like, uh, I don't know, uh, cheesy question, but I mean, um, what do you see? What do you see yourself in ten years? What do you see yourself in ten years? No, I mean, what do you see it going in terms of a trajectory? Um, I, well, of, um, uh, the, what I've been um, like, sort of really focusing on now is just simply establishing it as a brand that can live on beyond a nightclub. Um, that's why our website is so robust and like is an archive of the mashup scene for the past like 13 years. Like there's a thousand mashups on there. Um, I would love to host like on you know satellite radio a uh, an entire you know there's like a hundred channels on satellite radio. I could do the booty mashup channel. You, you know could, if, that uh, kind of thing. Could do that, you um, could do that. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, so I mean, there's always like things like, okay, what, what is, you know, not everyone can go to a nightclub. Not everyone wants to go to a nightclub. Um, but this music is still out there. That's why I was, even, you know, before we started this podcast, mm-hmm. I was telling you, yeah, everyone keeps telling me I should do a podcast. So who knows? Maybe Booty Mashup will, you know, have a podcast eventually. Okay. You know, so it's just sort of like figuring out what else we can do. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am completely smitten. <laughs> And blown leaf for leaf off of uh, my lotus flower uh, with Adrian, and and really what it all I mean, being as selfish as I am, I I just want to look forward to the future and be like, I want to talk to, I want more. Yeah, let's do another one. Let's sure. do another one. Yeah. Let's do another one. So I would really love to book you back, and then with uh, the clown and everything, I know he has questions. He was completely jealous. Oh no, no, I'm not gonna be able to make it. Oh uh, yeah, bring yeah. Bonobo. Do you know him? Uh, I've, I've just you touching know, shoulders. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, but you yeah. know, it's like you know, mutual yeah. admiration society totally, and totally. in our in our very incestuous uh, performance scene in yeah. San Francisco. Yeah. But folks out there, if I could suggest anything to you it is get out and get a piece of this person and this is what i want you to so this is only this is the shameless you, plug part this is the shameless plug part so please uh assist me. yeah go on um you can follow me on uh, instagram and facebook i'm adrian a booty and i'm sure somewhere in your uh <laughs> your tags and 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 everything it's there but uh uh, and also the easiest way is bootymashup.com. That's where uh, our parties are, where I'm DJing, and um, 
Yeah, I hope to see you at a party or at least just say hi on social media. That's not good enough, Adrian. No, We're no, going to talk about Rocktober. Rocktober? What's going on in Rocktober? Oh, literally Rocktober. Yeah, well, come damn. on. Damn. Oh, huh. There's always a big thing at the end of the month. I can't remember what it is, though. It's, um, <laughs> I remember it being our biggest party of the year, even bigger than New Year's Eve. What could it be? Oh, Halloween booty. <laughs> yeah, is, that um, for, is that a thing? Oh, that is a on huge Halloween thing. Night? No, not on Halloween night. I am DJing on yeah. Halloween proper so this is what at DNA Lounge. Yeah. Uh, DNA Lounge does a Halloween party. Um, DNA Lounge is my clubhouse um, uh, because that's our home base for Booty SF, but but, um, but we're doing our own Halloween booty party the Saturday before Halloween. Uh, we're gonna have all four rooms open. Um, my band Smash Up Derby is doing a all Halloween set. Um, we're gonna be throwing in spooky mashups. We've got like something for everyone. We've got a you know a hip hop room, uh, a video room, mashups in the main room. Uh, so it's gonna be it's a huge party, and we're keeping it really. I like. I never wanted to be that club promoter that, like, on New Year's Eve or Halloween, like, like overcharges. Um, if you buy tickets in advance, they're only twenty five bucks, you know, which is only five dollars more than what we normally are every Saturday night. So, you know, that's a lot of salad shooting out your way. So. <laughs> You better take heed and listen. But if you can't come on Halloween every Saturday night at DNA yeah. Lounge, yeah. Uh, Booty SF, yeah. And if for some reason you're not in San Francisco and you're listening to this podcast, go to the uh, Booty Mashup website, and hopefully there's a booty party in your town. What's Cur- the What's the currently? URL? Yeah, uh, booty booty, booty with an I E uh, Mashup dot com. Gotcha, gotcha. Cool, cool. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am going to wrap this up with a giant booty flower. And uh, thank you so much. Oh, thanks for for having me. I really appreciate it. Talking to you. I want to have you back. And uh, we'll see you all next time. 